Hello, 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 and welcome to today's edition of the Citizens Chat Show on Civic Space TV. I am Philip Melissa. Today, the chat is discussing Uganda's economy, the tax regime, but also the traders' standoff in the capital city of this country. Now, joining me in that conversation is a panel of distinguished citizens of this country, whom I will introduce. Starting from my extreme left, from Uganda People's Congress, the Honorable Ocheno Joseph. Honorable, good afternoon, and you're most welcome. It's a terrible afternoon for me. You're discussing Uganda's economy and 38 years of NRA, and they claim they're coming to stabilize Uganda's economy, sort out our politics, sort out our security and human rights. But uh, no, it's actually hellish. Before we came on air, we were busy battling here the basic definition of uh, anarchy. And if it is not anarchy in the last 40 years, what is? Thank you. We wait to hear more of that in the conversations. Next to Honorable Cheno is Professor Mwambusa Ndevesa. He is a political analyst. Professor, you're most welcome to the show. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share with the fellow citizens issues of national integration and national unity and building a nation. Because we don't have a nation, we still have a geographic expression called Uganda. Wow. Thank you, Professor. And next to the professor is from the Center for Constitutional Governance, Dr. Birete Sara. Doctor, you must welcome to the show and good afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, glad to be back on the citizens chat show. Thank you. And last but not least is Dr. Robert Ojambo from Chambogo University. Doctor, you most welcome and good afternoon. It's a good afternoon, only that it has been a very depressing week. Uh, just from Monday, huge people have uh, died. Yeah, we just saw the death of our iconic Martin Alike, uh, Dr. Krut, uh, and very many other people who have really been important in the service of this country. But also yesterday I traveled from the east and uh, other than during the time of COVID, it is this time that I saw dead towns. Uh, towns are dead, quiet, shops are locked and people are just like they are mourning. And all, in my view, as a result of poor administration. I thought from the east we get wise men. So what are the wise men doing, and women? Uh, in a situation <laughs> like this, uh, 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 when the administration is poor, yeah, wise you. people don't uh, emerge. Exercise their wisdom. In most cases, when <laughs> ad poor administration is, uh, is a, a, a workmanship of uh, not wise people. And wise people uh, cannot go in where the, the others are dominating. <laughs> because the wisdom in <laughs> them you. tells them to keep off. <laughs> and, and thank you. Case, thank uh, you. In, in any case, they are usually targeted for silence. And that was an official part of NRA. And that was official. But, so they <laughs> are exercising you. social control. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So the and conversation, self control. <laughs> the conversation is general about the economics of this country, Uganda, what Professor just said is not a nation, but a geographic expression of a country. I want to start with you, Dr. Sarah. If you were to talk to someone who has been out of the country for 10 years or 20 years, how best would you describe the state of the economy of Uganda? Well, the, maybe a brief, brief statistics <coughs> on Uganda's economy. First is the description that Uganda is a mixed economy system with private freedoms, but a centralized economic planning and regulation. So the regulatory function remains a duty of the state. Our GDP as of 2022, which is the available data, stands at 12,703 per capita for, a per, for individuals, that's about 40 million. And uh, per person specifically, it is a, an average of 3.5 million. And that's, this is very little money. As a country, our GDP is an average of 45.57 billion as, as a whole country. And Uganda is ranked 94th out of the major economies 
Global that is a billion US dollars. Yes, okay. United States okay. dollars. The sources of income in Uganda, uh, one is majorly agrarian, with the two-thirds of the working force or the labor force being employed in the agricultural sector. And the agricultural sector produces half of our export earnings. The contributors to Uganda's GDP are three areas. Agriculture produces 24.2% of GDP. The industry produces 25.5% and services produce 50.3% of our GDP. How about stealing? Corruption. That is services. <laughs> Let's come yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the top industries in Uganda are agriculture, forest, and fishing. And you have the average salary for the employable or employed labor force. The average salary ranges from 1 million to 2.5 million Uganda shillings. This is a range of $261 to $653. And the Bank of Uganda report states that only 1% of Ugandans earn 1 million and above. So I'm talking of the average earnings of 1 million percent of Ugandans. <laughs> the fastest growing sectors, the number one sector is the professionals, scientists, and technical activities at 28.6%. The administration support services stands at 17.8%. Hotels and restaurants, 12.4%. Information and communication, 10.3%. Animal production, 8.8%. Other factors to analyze when you're looking at the state of a country's economy are inflation levels, interest rate levels, employment percentages, investment, education and research, innovation and technology, climate change, and the taxation regime. We further need to evaluate the quality of human capital and the presence of knowledge-based industries, as well as policies supporting the intellectual property rights in the country. The indicators for a successful economy include workforce skills, entrepreneurship rates, integration of digital technologies, and all these indicators together are able to help quantify the brain economy's strength and potential for growth. So the question then that we need to digest for the citizens is whether Uganda's economy offers opportunities for growth, what are the challenges and obstacles to development, and why is it that there is no real connection between the paper economy and the real economy in people's wallets. Well, thank you so much, Doctor, for that detailed expression about the economy of the country. I want to come to you, Dr. Jambo. When you link what Dr. Sarah has given us in terms of figures from World Bank, from the Bank of Uganda, and so on, it drives us into something that is currently happening in the country where traders, and you hinted on it as part of your introduction, there is a strike currently undergoing in the country. Traders are closing their shops because of what comes out of the behavior of the economy, taxation. We've had many strikes in the country. What makes this particular one very special and what would then call upon the government of Uganda to have a specific action towards the cause. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. And Sarah, thank you so much for that background to give us a picture of our economy. And uh, economy is very, very important in any society. Uh, there have been an argument, Kwame Nkuruma said, seek ye the political kingdom and the rest will be fine. Adam Smith argued that he, uh, if we put in Nkrumah's world, seek ye the economy, and uh, the rest will be fine, including Karl Marx with all his uh, 
uh, contradictions. Now, Uganda's economy, in fact, it is very difficult to talk about Uganda's economy in real sense. Because Uganda is a very big thing. Some of these things, when you talk about the economy, you are just taking a representative sample. There are some people who you look at and you say, are these also in Uganda's economy? And you wonder whether they are part of the economy. Of course, they are affected. That's how it comes in. And Isara tried to give a lot of things. Of course, these African economies have been a big struggle. After independence, there was a deliberate uh, policy to build some economy of some sort. And that's why <coughs> at independence in the 1960s, we were at the same level with the Malaysias, with the Singapore, and many of these uh, Asian tigers. We were almost the same. But uh, there, it was because we had inherited the colonial economy, which continued to exist into the the world, of course, at that time, Uganda was a, one of the highest exporters of uh, coffee and cotton and the other little things. After the 66 crisis, there were a lot of problems. With the coming of Amin, the economy almost collapsed because of Amin. There was a lot of embargoes against Amin, and he was not also strategic to plan better. He was just doing what they call the survival economy, people getting what to eat. Of course, in 1990s, there came the structural adjustment programs. And the structural adjustment programs, uh, motivated by World Bank and IMF, sort of misguided African economies, Uganda inclusive, and told them that they cannot do business, that the, the, the state cannot do business, that the state has no business, no, no, no duty in any business entity. Its work is just to organize, as she was saying, organize them, then get taxes. So we, the state almost rel relinquished most of uh, its activities in transport, in production, and in many other sectors of the economy. So they only remained as employer. They are the biggest employer still, uh, and, uh, and tax collectors in most cases. So companies and, and entities that used to belong to the state collapsed immediately, including the, the, road, the road corporation, I mean the transport corporations. And yet when you go to other economies, if you look at the German economy, you look at the British economy, they are very, very strong in certain sectors up to today. Uh, even these it, 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 Scandinavian countries like Denmark and, and, and others, you find that the state is so much concerned in some sectors. So the state in Uganda only remained to be a tax collector. And uh, that has caused a problem because uh, at the end of the day, the budget, they tell us that the budget is 58, 58 trillion. And out of the 58 trillion, uh, we are going to collect 29 trillion by URA. The rest are debts and loans and what have you. So you don't see government producing anything. In other words, government is not selling anything, but they need to run an economy. So at the end of the day, the only thing has been tax. And as I said last time when we were discussing this matter, even the tax base is so small. Because you can only tax people who have something. In Uganda, they keep taxing the same people. The same people, the civil servant, is the one who pays almost all taxes. And because even the trader and the others transfer their taxes to the consumer. And the person here who has a, what we would call disposable income, uh, which, which creates effective demand, is only a civil servant or somebody who works for salary. So at the end of the day, that's why you see that right now the issue of taxes have become very serious. And with the just fast forward, to run fast forward, after COVID-19 and the passing of the homosexuality bill, uh, much of our budget was being supported by uh, 
uh, external agencies. Mm, they were running a lot of things on sub provision of services like UNICEF and so on for children, for education, for health, and many other entities. Most of these stopped instantly, and uh, people even packed their things and went away. Then COVID also affected some economies which were helping us. They said now we cannot offer. So the government has come up with a, a, a wrath on its people. Uh, so much so that uh, right now, they are going to tax people times 1,000. You pay VAT, after VAT you pay excise duty, after excise duty you pay, you pay uh, payers you earn, after payers you earn you pay, uh, 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 they are going to introduce even uh, some, uh, some of us who are good speakers here. We may soon start paying for speaking. So the, there is a, what we call tax duplication. That is the major problem as I finish. The first problem is duplicating tax. Now, that has also created a problem in tax management. The tax management entities or agencies have become brutal, have become very brutal. Uh, for example, I was watching TV the other day. The, 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 the Kenyans are exporting Irish potatoes to Rwanda. And the Uganda. And the Uganda. And some, much, much of it is just passing here to go to Rwanda. But uh, the tax officials are impounding these vehicles without even knowing that Irish potato is perishable. So the Irish potato is perishing at Malaba and Busia, and it, because that one I call it brutal. It is brutal. Uh, then here, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, as we shall see in details, why these traders are striking. <laughs> If you are found not to have complied with the, that system, the penalties are too big. The penalties are bigger than the tax. The tax. So Thank that's you. why the traders, I think, have reached a moment and they have said enough is enough. Many people are, say, are convincing us that the reason the traders are, are, are striking is because they are ignorant. They don't understand the system. In fact, it is URI which is even more mm -hmm. ignorant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor, for that. Uh, I want to come to you, Professor Andevesa. When you listen to Dr. Jambo here, he says government is coming out to tax Ugandans times a thousand because it no longer receives enough money from the people that used to give it, the donors. When we look at these taxes and specifically in relation to the system URA is putting out the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing solutions. What is this IFRIS and why is it a big challenge? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, but maybe if you don't mind, let me divert you a bit and reframe issues. I thought at first you could first exhaust the question of the state of play of the economy and we shall come to the tax after in another round. Because if we mix the two, uh, then we may not give, we may, we may not uh, do justice to the two, although somehow they are linked. So if I am allowed, let me first make a comment or two on the state of the economy. Uh, Dr. Jambo talked about uh, Adam Smith, who talked about the wealth of nations. But well, that was in the 18th century, I think, yes. something like that. And yes. this is not the 18th century. 1870. I think by now, we should be, these days, we should be talking about the wealth of the people, not the wealth of the nations. Let's now look at the people, not necessarily the nations. After saying, uh, making that statement, I think when we are looking at the economy in terms of productivity, in terms of quality, when we are looking at the economy deeply, we should look at the quality of the economy rather than the quantity, because the quantity can deceive in the sense that it can give you a picture which is not sustainable, but the quality would give you a picture that is sustainable. So if I was to evaluate the economy in Uganda, I would look at labor productivity, which Sarah hit a goal. What, I didn't come with the figures, but next time we can come with the figures. What is the labor productivity of Ugandans? Last time I checked, labor productivity of Uganda was lower 
than traditional East Africa, Kenya, and Tanzania. Actually, in some respects, they were saying that Uganda's labor productivity was five times lower than labor productivity, productivity in Kenya. And yet this is reverse, because people used to come uh, 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 to, 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 to come to in the 60s, for example, the Kenyans would come to work here, then around the 70s, would go to Kenya. Now, the Kenyans are coming here to offer labor, meaning that their labor productivity is appreciated here compared to Ugandans. Labor productivity. Two, soil productivity. Is soil productivity in Uganda increasing, decreasing, or what is the status of soil productivity? I am afraid soil productivity in Uganda is lowering at an alarming rate. And that's why Uganda, which used to produce the best matoke in Uganda, today there are no matoke there because the, labor, uh, the, the soil has lost its productivity. So they are producing look, in bid. If we don't look at <laughs> If yeah, we don't look at the uh, uh, soil productivity, sooner than later, the Ugandan, the Ugandan soil which has been prized about will be no more. Three, look at agricultural productivity. We may look at Uganda as uh, exports increasing, production increasing, but if you don't look at the productivity, very soon you will see the graph plunging down because agricultural productivity in some crops is declining by 50%. I think economists should look at productivity rather than production. The two are different. You can increase production as productivity is lowering. You can increase the acreage you are planting and therefore you are producing more peanuts, but the, 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 the soil is getting depleted and you are not increasing on hybrids and at the end of the day, that increased production will come tumbling down. So we should look at productivity of the people, of the soil, and of the crops. Something else I wanted to look at as a yardstick for measuring the state of the economy and how far we are going, especially under NRM. We should use the NRM yardstick itself, which was establishing an integrated self-sustaining national economy. So is Uganda's economy integrated? Is it self-sustaining? Is it national? Those are the questions. If I can answer those hypothetical questions, uh, hypotheses, if you want, in terms of the national economy, is Uganda's major, or what they used to call commanding heights in, the, in, 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 in UPC1, which was the move to the left strategy, the major sectors of the economy which have influence on the other sectors, which ones are in the hands of Ugandans? Here we are talking about, for example, oil companies. They are all foreign owned. Look at the banks, which make a lot of money. Huh? They mobilize all the proceeds, all the proceeds in this country, and take them outside. There is no bank which is indigenous. The, the nearest to be indigenous is Centenary, but I think now 49 shares are with the foreigners. Look at insurance companies. Yes. yes. Look at, info, uh, at insurance companies. They are foreign owned. Look at these uh, 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 companies that uh, export. Telecom companies. Look at the telecom companies. They are all foreign owned. So how can you have a national economy when all these major commanding heights of the economy are foreignized? You definitely cannot. Now, let us come to the export earnings. They later didn't actually touch on it. The major export earnings today, as we talk, is gold. It has surpassed coffee. It is actually is said to be earning Uganda in the region of 1.4 trillion uh, billion dollars. When agriculture is just about 800 million dollars. But now, who is involved in the gold industry? You have seen the pictures on TV of those artisanal miners mining gold. They are the poorest of the poor. They are the richest of the earth in Uganda. And yet, our biggest export earner is gold. Where is the gold coming from? But let's leave that to But who is earning from that gold? 
And Uganda even is not hanging from that gold because somehow the taxing of gold was suspended. Very few companies are taxing that gold. So when you look at the surface of the economy, it, it looks growing anyway, because it is growing by certain percentage, I think now 5%. And the inflation is somehow manageable compared to the, to the, to the region. But then how come that it is not felt in the pockets of the people? But if, let's leave even the pockets. How come that it is not reflected in the medicine, the hospitals, on the roads that we see, the potholes, or even debt payment? Why do we have a crisis? That means there is a problem, there is a mismatch between the economy that is growing and the human development indices that look like we are not growing or we are growing at a slower rate. And economic growth or development, or development generally, should not be looked at, we are talking about the wealth of people now, should not be looked at even how the total uh, 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 assets produced in the country or the earnings growth, we should also look at the disparity. Uganda's income inequality between classes is expanding. But much more so, spatial disparity. You hear some regions like this and Uganda, northern Uganda, they are 60% poor. I think by the latest uh, statistics didn't even capture that poverty. Eh? That poverty that Ugos gives us. Regional poverty. Regional poverty. Dimensional poverty. Yeah, but the dimensional poverty, which is growing, which is increasing. So you can see a paradox, we call it a paradox. I hope that's not complicated English for the listeners. It is an irony, let me use the, the, the simple one. Uh, or a mismatch, where you have captured a, an economic statistics that shows that the GDP is growing, but certain regions are becoming worse and worse. And certain individuals are becoming worse and worse. So um, my argument here is that uh, we should have an economy that is well planned with a very clear agenda, but the agenda must be defined. Is it a progressive agenda or a reactionary agenda? Because if you claim that you are revolutionaries, as our government claims, and it is a part of the masses, mm. then we should have a radical agenda. Which agenda would be informed by having a wealth or a development that works for the people? for Ugandans, and that that wealth must be equitably uh, shared throughout the country. Even our, uh, our main theme for uh, the NAM, non-aligned movement, was shared affluence. So why are we talking about shared affluence in the world and not talking about shared affluence in Uganda? And planning the economy that all regions should have Eco development opportunities. Now, all industries are concentrated along the Tororo Kampara axis. There are no industries dispersed in Moyo, in Karamoja. Imagine in Karamoja, they are mining limestone now in Karamoja, but it is processed here in Mukono. Don't the Karamoja people also want that employment? Why isn't the industry there since now we even have power there and some tarmac roads? That is lack of a planned economy to make sure that the whole country benefits, all classes benefit, all regions benefit. But as we talk, the inequality, we have got higher levels of inequality, that is economic inequality, in terms of class and, and, and in terms of, of, of regions. So when you are planning the economy to have qualitative growth as well as equality growth uh, uh, under an agenda, that is pro people. You know, we, these days we talk about pro people, this pro people, these people's revolution, uh, Uganda people's defense forces, people's peoples, but that people is in inverted commas. We need to remove the inverted commas because how can you say it is peoples when some people have become so rich that their problem tonight for the meals is which type, which part of the goat do you eat? Tonight should we eat the, the ribs or the offals, or the thigh, 
or the chicken or whatever when others don't even have what to buy with the chikomando. <laughs> there are some people are now uh, bothered by which hospital outside should I go to? Should I go to South Africa or Agakan Nairobi or India or Italy or New York? When others have no choice even to go to Chirubu. And you say the economy is growing without the people, the wealth of the people. Some people do not know that others actually don't have money to go and buy something in Chikubu. They don't. Some people are now getting problems of which Prado, which latest model should I buy? When others do not have even a Futibishi, the, 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 the feet, they don't have shoes to put on the shoes so that they can walk all the way from Kampara up to uh, Gayaza or Kawempe. Now, when you have such a country with such an economic growth without a development, you are creating two countries in one and you will not have peace. I have heard people talking about peace, even the Electoral Commission is talking about uh, uh, being allocated 500 million to go and organize a, 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 peace, a peace prayer. I am telling you there won't be peace unless we work for peace. And the only way to work for peace is to organize an economy, uh, politics, that will enable most Ugandans have equitable sharing of power, equitable sharing of resources, equitable access to public resources. Thank you so much, Professor. And if I come to you, Honorable Cheno, among the many things Professor talks about is planning the economy. And many of those processes are in the hands of you, the politicians. Until now, why are you politicians not planning for the economy of Uganda? Because um, the politicians are not in government. The politicians are predominantly in UPC, maybe a hand was scattered in one or two other political organizations. The guys in government and the guys who are ruling this country are people using politics. So they're in politics using politics, they're not politicians. The politicians took over uh, the reign of this uh, country at independence. And um, just as uh, Dr. Njambo is uh, giving himself less credit as Africans, I can tell you, Dr. Jambo, that uh, when we attained independence in 1962, uh, the post-colonial government, which was then led, of course, by ourselves, UPC, um, did something that you should credit yourself with as Ugandans, that we managed to inherit from the British. And instead of sinking it like Museveni sank our economy, what he inherited from UPC and others, you know, we built on it. And we built on it from 1962, 63, 64, 65, 66, even amidst the political crisis of 1966, continued to build on it. And by 1968, post 68, 69, Post the, the 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 crisis of 66-67, um, we then came out bolder as a, a Republican political party, recognizing elements of Republicanism that the professor is referring to, uh, and seeing a new Uganda in which we wanted to make sure that uh, the people of this country holistically uh, genuinely gained from their independence. And for that reason, we came with the, the bold move to the left, uh, you know, pushed by, backed by. A very progressive socialist agenda, uh, the, 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 the move to the left, as it were. By 1970 71, Uganda's economy was amongst the star, sterling economies on the African continent. Uh, 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 so we had a net progressive uh, push, and, uh, but it was based on a very considered uh, economic uh, uh, programs and visions, leftist leaning, something for which this energy regime, after 38 years, has been a country rev revolutionary about many basically opposed, did everything to reverse it. But I'll explain that later. Sarah, the introduction, um, was um, uh, giving us the figures on the, the state of the Uganda's economy, just to avoid the mixture. Uh, she was talking about Uganda's economy as part of the contributions to the GDP. And that is where we refer to agriculture at 24%, uh, industry at 25%, and indeed services at 50 But really, really, really part of the beat that uh, 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 Professor is talking about is this, that the composition of the Uganda's economy, as we know it, as we know it, you know, uh, agriculture should co constitutes today 71%. Uh, 
Uh, this mixes up with part of what Professor and uh, the, the two academicians are referring to. An industry only being seven percent, and services at twenty percent. So what are we saying? We are saying that agriculture, <laughs> which is the backbone of the predominant majority of Ugandans, you know, day to day living on, have eighty percent or thereabout, have remained predominantly subsistence, and therefore hand to mouth. Now, this NRA bandits coming from the bush and call themselves governments, you know, they came and broke it. I'll give a quick example. Dr. Jambo is near home in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Bositem, which is basically mine, near Tororo. There is the National Agricultural College, deliberately founded by the first music company in the 60s, you know, <laughs> recognizing that. The place became a forest, a bush, and is now a town called a mini university. Meaning that there has never, and there was never really and been an investment, strategic investment, by the state in the, the most important aspect of the economy, which is by and large agriculture. So had we expanded capacity onto that, you know, in part we'd be answering the question. So in other words, how do we boost general strategic economic expansion of the state? Uh, Professor again is talking about uh, this thing about the Karamujong thing. You know, we had um, the meat packers in Lira. Meat, meat packers in Lira. No, in Soroti. In Soroti, in Soroti. But Lira because... the ginning, be, cotton ginning. Cotton ginning in, in Lira. But partly because those were areas where most of these were things were being produced. So you think about it strategically. So what has happened in our economy is explained by a new book that I think everyone must read. I'm not going to over-popularize it. But I just read it and um, um, just sent to me. But it's a text that actually challenges, and if you don't mind, um, it says that for the last three decades, very important, and I won't waste time, Uganda has been one of the fastest, fastest growing economies as presented, that globally praised as a success story. The country has become an exemplar of economic and political reform for those who espouse, for those who espouse neoliberal agenda. The celebratory narrative masks the disrupted social impact of these reforms and silences the complex and persistent crisis resulting from neoliberal transformation. Without going into the, too much of the detail, what really basically happened that once Museveni handed himself Ahmed and World Bank, Ahmed and World Bank literally instructed him to kill government. So start by simply saying that um, privatize everything. Now, in privatizing everything, it was not privatizing to this, the cries of my two academic uh, uh, friends here. Privatize everything, give it to excess capital, and the guys who were pushing for profit motive will predominantly be non ugandans So it's not surprising that Pineti comes and she's engaged in hospitals. Now, what is it special that Pineti needs to be able to do to build a hospital in the world? Nobody asks, and Dr. Jamba, I know there's a challenge in this, nobody asks, how did we build the hospitals that we built in the 60s? How could we build them at the time, within such a short period of time? And 40, 60 years later, with all the technology, technological advances and all the privileges of big free money sometimes, because we said it had to be bought sometimes with free money by Anglo-America in order to do for them the bidding in the region, and nothing happens. It has just been directly a result of a, a, a political miscalculation in this country, where people, instead of... Uh, uh, um, uh, recognizing our national uh, economic challenges and linking our political challenges, um, we decided to associate with enemies of the Republic of Uganda, handed over the rule of Uganda into the hands of people who basically are uh, anti-Uganda opponents of Uganda. In this case, we ended up with the likes of the 70s, whose interest is basically to push their own family agenda, personal agenda, and sometimes in many cases, humanist agenda, and then the Republic of Uganda has now been left or, on its own, hence basically partly where, where we are. Really, there is no economy, you know, and, and I don't know how, my, how much you can go on this, because my, my colleagues actually gave a fantastic foundation on this. It's just common sense. Um, Dr. Jambo is talking about the trans transportation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Irish potatoes to, 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 to run from Kenya. I keep on saying, just like we discussed before we came on air, no Ugandan is angry like I am that Museveni came and found rail networks, and the rail networks are dead. I don't know in contemporary history, and the two historians are here, I don't know which major global economy, you know, <laughs> industrialized, you know, without use of railways. So the NRA was even killed, but he found our railways. Now, some of those railways were, colonial ex were established by the colonial predom predominant, but he was expanded it, you know. So you, you see that we, 
Sometimes obviously we blame others, but it's very much about ourselves. What has happened in Uganda's economy today is that we ended up with having people who are using politics in, rather than politicians. In any case, anyways, I, I, I feel, you know, um, politics, not surprisingly, is now the most enterprising thing in town, no longer enter enterprises and businesses. So people now go into politics to become billionaires, and billionaires, you know the answer. Where do you get billionaires? Where actually billionaires are people in business? Where do you get, who, who are the people who are going to innovate? Thank you so much. Patronage. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chenno, for that. Uh, Dr. Sarah, when you listen to what the three gentlemen talk about and what you earlier talked about, it really shows the economy is not playing good for the average Ugandan, wherever he is, be it in the north, east, west, or central here. The productivity professor refers to is in the hands of the Ugandan. In the near future, how does government help this Ugandan to revive the productivity rather than the production to see that this country grows economically? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah the, the, if I come to the means of production and the role of government to aid productivity of the citizens, let me just share some of the more statistics that mm. the previous speakers have talked about. One is the balance of trade. Mm data for this country. We are at $5.399 billion deficit. deficit. Meaning that the balance between our imports and exports mm -hmm. falls mm -hmm. short mm -hmm. by, and it has been a permanent, a permanent mm -hmm. deficit, mm -hmm. by $5.39 billion. What's the size of our exports? Our total exports are valued at $4.2 million. <laughs> Our total imports yeah. are valued at $8.3 million. That's double. double. So we import more, double, twice, than we export. Other than gold that the professor talked about, uh, coffee was almost hitting the $1 billion mark by January, mid-January. It was at $999 million. You know, and uh, but there has been a decline in March, a 9.3% decline in, the, in our coffee exports. I don't know caused by what. When you look at in, our, in year? yes, in, in this year, in, in March this year. So when you look at our income inequalities, 10% Uganda's rich people own 36% of the national economy. The 10% poorest Ugandans own 2.5% of our national economy. And 20% of the poorest Ugandans own 5.8% of the national economy. Our poverty line ranges between 0.88 to $1.04 dollars as of October 2022. That's the basic minimum people need not go hungry, less than a dollar a day. So when you look at the income disparities. There's a mismatch, and because yes, the economy is said to be growing. Yeah, but growing in whose pockets? <laughs> yeah. Growing in whose pockets? So when you look at the multidimensional poverty statistics, in regions like Bukedi, Karamoja, Lango, and Achori. others are above 60%. Deprivation, extent of deprivation, above 60%. So that's the extent of poverty, and it is higher in the rural mm -hmm. more than the urban. Yet one would assume that the cost of living in the rural is a bit low. Yeah. But we also have food insecurity in the rural areas. So when you look at the factors of production or mode of that you would increase citizens' productivity, I want to look at the Singapore's model for development, which is usually referred to as the Singaporean model or the Singapore economic miracle. Because Singapore shot from third world mm. to first world under Lee Kuan Yew and, and, and the, it has been a key study case for how third world countries can evolve. The characteristics that led the leapfrog of Singapore from third world to first world, one was strong government intervention. 
The government played a significant role in economic planning and development, providing strategic direction, investing in infrastructure, and actively promoting economic growth. Yeah. Singapore created a situation that they called social peace, whereby they created conditions for, I know we talk a lot of investors here, but it's more of lip service. The Singapore is not a lip service. So they created investors whom they taxed to provide basic services yeah. for all the citizens. Basic quality education, basic quality health, Basic, you know, the sanitation facilities. In Uganda, when you go to the data of who can access clean water, or who is co connected to the national grid for, for electricity, basic electricity in a home, that in some areas it's less than 10%. Mm. So these are the infrastructure that would increase the productivity of the citizens through creation of cottage industries. I know we talk about infrastructure like PDM. Uh, I know the slip of tongue, but the Mufti on ED. I was hearing in news and I laughed. I said this was a good mistake. So he said the poverty development model <laughs> instead of parish. <laughs> instead of parish development model. Because when you look at PDM. That was not a slip of a tongue. Uh, it's philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. Yes. So I, you look at PDM, that you lend a person one million shillings. These are people who can't go to hospital, who can't take children to school. I have been saying that this money will disappear in a week in whatever homestead it will go to because of the problems. Two, there has been no meaningful training in terms of financial interest. You have given me money. Somebody has never seen one million dollars. They have a million problems. They have no training. What do you expect? That is one of the examples. But what is the second factor for Singapore? Open and export-oriented economy. Singapore embraces a free trade that has positioned itself as a global hub for trade and investment. It has a pro-invest business environment, low taxes, Minimum trade barriers, which attract foreign investment and facilitate exports. And I know we are going into the debate on taxes. So does our tax regime facilitate economic growth? Or it prohibits, it's a barrier. The third factor was education and skills development. Singapore places a strong emphasis on education and skills training to develop a higher skilled workforce. What is our investment in the workforce in this country? We are talking of e-economy, technological advancement and adaptability. Only 25% of Uganda's population can access internet. So how adaptable is the population of Uganda? And we also have a big gender divide through this right of you know, digital access and digital literacy skills. In, so, in the South Sub-Saharan Africa, so in some countries, there is a 60% gender divide between men and women who have skills to meaningfully use internet. So how will we cover these gaps? The other factors are more of prudent economic policies that the Singapore implemented. Of course, there is no corruption. We have seen the president firefighting corruption or even paying, paying lip service with the investment corruption unit, statement and corruption unit, this unit, that unit, but corruption is on the increase and investors are, are running away. I interacted in December with some investor in pharmaceuticals through Netherlands who was told to bribe people one million dollars to get a meeting with the president mm. to be able to invest in the pharmaceutical industry in Uganda. And he left, he's mm. in Kenya. Why would he beseech us? <laughs> so does this climate then facilitate <coughs> the, the active productivity of the citizens? When you go beyond this data and the comparisons, let's look at the economic policies of NRM. No, no, before you leave that, I wanted to, yes, to, to give you some more factor yes. information about Singapore. Yes. 
meritocracy. Yes, yeah. Uh, very important. Meritocracy uh, that they identified. In Uganda, there is this uh, language of identification of cadres and the deployment of cadres. In Uganda, what they mean, you identify somebody who is very royal, who sings most of the NRM songs, and then you deploy them even when they have no commitment and skills. In Singapore, the identification of the cadre, the cadre definition was somebody who has good skills, excellent skills, and character, and therefore would be deployed accordingly. They were not identifying a psychophant. That, that is identifying a psychophant and deploying that one in the right place. That was not a cadre identification. So we need to redefine our cadre identification criteria. Not necessarily the one who says, eh, 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 <laughs> like our UPCs used to say. How was that? This was in national interest. <laughs> So, <laughs> identification of cadership should have a different criteria. That is how Singapore, South Korea, and Malaysia developed cadre identification based on merit, not based on psychophancy. Yes, and uh, just a few minutes to conclude. So, since NRM came to power, it came with, you know, change, it kept changing cash crops for people to grow. Mm -hmm. One day it's promoting Robusta Coffee. The second day, it's promoting vanilla. The third day, it's saying approved vanilla. Now it is silk. This is silk worms. And then red the, pepper. Then you had red pepper. I don't <laughs> even know what now Mangos. they are promoting. So you had the population taken through a roller coaster of plant this, now approved to this, this is the one. Now approved to this. The president would come with a different language altogether. Grow vanilla. Grow this. Grow robust. People cut down. Hash avocado. People cut down coffee trees in, 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 in Bisheng. Mm. So that confusion of the political leadership in terms of cash crops, which take a, diff a longer period to mature, which grow different uh, in different regions mm. and type of soils. So there is no direction of the masses by the leadership in terms of economic productivity. Thank you so much, Doctor, and thank you so much colleagues for those amazing sub submissions. The Citizens Chat show takes a very short break and we shall be right back. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. You are still on Uganda's leading freedom platform, the Civic Space TV, and this is the Citizens Chat Show. I am Philip Molisa. Today, the conversation is on Uganda's economy, the tax regime, and the trader standoff in the city and all the major cities in the country. And joining me in that conversation is Honorable Cheno Joseph, mm -hmm. Professor Ndebesa Mambusia, Dr. Sarah Birete, and Dr. Robert Yojambo. Mm -hmm. While we left off, we were discussing the challenges of the economy and how it is structured. And I want to come to you, Dr. Yojambo, as we conclude on this topic. From where we stand, the status we've described all through the first segment of the show, how do we pull out some of these challenges and see a corrected economic flow of this country? Yeah, the, the economy of Uganda is not by mistake where it is. It's by design. 
Uh, when NRM came to power, indeed our economy was not doing well because at that time Uganda was in crisis. Uh, so there were so many things that were not working. But uh, I think the diagnosis of the problem was uh, wrong. Uh, the, the thinking was, uh, how do you rejuvenate the economy from where it was? And therefore, there were a lot of gambling. So YORM7 has tried in many other areas. He has tried in military. He's a star there. There, he, we can even export him to other countries which have problems, and I know he will succeed. But administration, he has scored very low. He has scored very low in administration. And you know the economy is managed by the administrative prowess of a leader. Uh, and uh, this is uh, basically not because the man is very poor. But I think Yoerim 7 is a very selfish individual who thinks about himself and his government. So the economy of Uganda is surrounded around maintaining NRM in power. So that's why we don't have what these people were talking about, something to build a national economy integrated, which helps everybody. That is not his intention. And it's not that it is by accident. It is by design. Because you must create. I have heard him several say it himself, that Ugandans are very funny people. They like money. And therefore, free money. And therefore, he is the only giver of that money. So the economy is around him to protect the NRM. And that's why most of the programs that come are really makeshift programs. They are not there to develop the individual that he was talking about, and we have a people wealth. No. It's just to woodwink the individuals to think that something is being done. I remember at first, the first thing was Bonabagagaware. And it was as empty as you can hear it. Bonabagagaware, for people who don't understand Luganda, is that wealth for everybody. Was it? And it, mm. it cannot yes. be. It cannot be. So what was done to, pr to, br uh, what was done to bring Kwanika, wealth for all? Kwanika, they were Kwanika. giving uh, Haifa. They are giving Haifa uh, selected families. And those families, you had to be a chairperson of NRM or a very strong mobilizer. They give you a Haifa. And their politics was that that Haifa, when it produces, you give to another person and another person. Economically, that cannot work. That is just uh, patronizing people. Then from there, he said modernization of agriculture. And modernization of ag agriculture came with a lot of things. And modernization of agriculture, by the way, was a very good program. But in the modernization of agriculture, they picked only one element. One element of modernization of agriculture. And they, they came up with the NADS. Uh, NADS. Uh, for those who know NADS, we don't want even to go into the scientific and the name for it. But NADS was that process of giving people coffee and uh, some improved uh, seeds to grow. And uh, this NADS is one of the biggest scandals that have been in Uganda. There was NADS 1, NADS 2, and NADS 3. In northern Uganda, they were growing cassava, and you would see an, a signpost of NADS. But when you look at where the signpost is, <laughs> it's a bush or a small garden of cassava. So NADS, I came to realize it was just a process of getting budgetary money, putting it there, not to grow crops and whatever they were talking, but to do other things. So NADS collapsed. I think now it is not even talked about. Then, of course, it came, it came up to now this PDM. When you look at carefully PDM, I don't think that, uh, before I leave NADS, uh, we came up with these model farms. I don't know whether you were seeing them, and uh, the president himself established one in Luero, in a place, to co in a place called Chimwanyi, I think, Chimwanyi, or somewhere about that, after Wabitu Nguru. And uh, I checked this farm was costing uh, 
4 billion shillings. Seriously? Uh, and what I saw the president harvest <clears throat> from that farm was one time he got a huge pineapple. One pineapple and he was very happy that he has <laughs> started getting money from what he invested. Because this man would go to the farm, he has to be taken by a helicopter, it lands in a certain primary school, then a convoy takes him there, then they hold it and they were calculating that every day that he went to that farm, he was spending 2.5 million shillings. Just two. No, no. 2.5 billion every on, time on he what? went to the farm. On what? Ah, you know when the president is traveling, he yes, spends 2.5 billion shillings on, on, on convoy, on what, on staffing. Because if um, seven is supposed to go to a farm, there must be soldiers there for a week. Secret service. Uh, there must be children to wait for him to sing for him somewhere. There must be some farms for him to explain. The man has gone to farm. The bicycle, I don't know where they would get the bicycle. I remember the magic bicycle which he was using to carry grass. Then the water, uh, mineral water bottle of irrigating the farm. I don't know where that technology died. I don't know why it has not grown. So if you look at all those things, they're just woodwink people. They are not really helping people to get out of poverty. Then, now, uh, this PDM, Parish Development Model, I have seen people very excited with it. I have no hope, just like I did not have hope on Vonaba Gagaware, then modernization, then, then prosperity, then Mioga. These things are normally slogans to woodwink the people for the next vote. You wait, in 2016, I mean 2026, there is going to be another development uh, slogan that is going to be brought to reinforce PDM. Because many of you have forgotten that Mioga is still going on, Mioga, the Mioga project. So in all, our economy is, uh, cannot be self-sustaining like he, he was arguing, cannot be national, cannot deal with the problems that he, she was talking about because Yoweri Museveni's economy, I normally call it Yoweri Museveni economics. And now he has put there uh, a permanent secretary who, uh, who understands that type of uh, economics, mango economics, where he explains to people, very cynical, that when you grow a mango, one mango has uh, how many fruits, how much is a fruit, and uh, how much money is that? That's how he was calculating his six million income per family that he, they calculate the how many mangoes trees are in, in the in the in an acre, how many fruits are on one tree, how much is it? But if everybody grows mangoes, and you have seen, if everybody grows mangoes in a village, who will buy from the other? Because we don't have factories. In other words, <laughs> Agriculture goes hand in hand with the value addition uh, or processing. And in Uganda, is the only place that, for example, there, was a, there are industries in eastern Uganda to, to, to do juice. It is shocking that the oranges that were brought to Teso and many areas of eastern Uganda mm. cannot be used in those factories because they don't have enough juice. So we have to import oranges from Kenya. We are now importing oranges from Kenya. If these people are not what the people in, Baga, in, Buga, in Kampala here call Vafere, who are they? Number two, uh, economics or, or agriculture goes with the agricultural extension services. When I was growing up, there used to be agricultural extension officers. In fact, the first motorcycle I saw was for an agricultural okay. extension officer. He used to move with this motorcycle looking after cattle. We, our place does not have a lot of cattle, but even if you had three heads of cattle, they would come and look at it. That was the first thing that was killed. Now, these days, I see the president is the one who calls all the media uh, people and explains to them how to grow coffee, how to do... The president cannot be an agriculturalist, be a soldier, be an economist, be everything. We need, if, if you are to develop agriculture, that is one area that needs to be helped. Chigezi, or Kabare, in brief, has been producing two items very well. 
Irish potato. In fact, for us these days, we call it Kabare potatoes, because mm. Irish wear, this thing comes from Kabare. And cabbages, uh, with this thing, which is, uh, this red thing is called what? Uh, for juice. They were the best in this country. They were producing those things. At first, people were producing their own Irish potato, indigenous ones. Uh, the Nards process came and introduced them to the hybrid. Now, the hybrid is quite expensive. You must fertilize the land. You must get uh, 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 pesticides and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so many other things. So, they are no longer sustainable because it's expensive for a local farmer in Kavari. And that's why now we are exporting Irish potato from Kenya because Kavari can no longer sustain our market. Can you imagine? Importing, I think. Eh? We are importing, mm. importing from Kenya, sorry. Mm. We are importing from Kenya. And from Egypt for uh, KFC. Yes. So this creates a very big problem. You can't say that Uganda is an agricultural country and we are importing Irish potatoes. We are importing apples and all fruits from South Africa. We are importing all sorts of things if you go to these supermarkets. In fact, I sometimes sympathize with Ugandans who, who are outraged. We don't want GMOs. We don't want... Ever. But these GMOs are coming from South Africa to our markets here, and they are being allowed. And if you check, some good, good supermarkets indicate, indicate that these are they are there. Majority of them do not. So, th so that is a very big problem. And if you don't mind, just to confirm that, the, the other point that we started on with Sarah, that agriculture at 71 to 80 percent, you know, you know, in, involved, which is the core of the economy, yeah? And we still have to import. Food, basic food. foods. For the very basic processing of. The so industry. as I so finish, to just to economy. illustrate to you yeah. that sometimes our president is a very unique individual. When he's explaining agriculture in Iluero and other parts of Uganda, he explains it in a rudimentary way, where they are using water, uh, mineral water bottle to irrigate, they are using a bicycle to carry grass okay. for mulching. When he is explaining it in his place, in Ankole, I have evidence, mm. he's using a motorized tractor, he's... Uh, he was, he, mm -hmm. he was talking about these miliki, they call them miliki what? Harvest. Mi, miliki preservation machine. And he's telling people that it is, too, it is too bad you to go under a cow that you are still milking in this era. Why don't you use machines? So <laughs> when you look at the economy, when you look at the economy of that region, and you compare it with the economy of Luero, is this president building a national economy? No. He's advising people in Ankole to sell their, 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 their small cattle and buy hybrid, buy Frasians and these things and reduce the, the thing. Here, he's teaching people to use water, water, <laughs> water, mineral water bottles to irrigate their farms of <laughs> banana. Really, does that make Thank sense? You. So in my view, in my view, Museveni's economics mm. is only to keep him and his regime in power. He does not care whether other people in Karamoja die. For example, in Karamoja, there is a lot of money that was put under the, the office of the minister of Karamoja to promote the growing of cereals in Karamoja. Somebody needs to go and assess. How far has that achieved there? Are they how much cereals are coming from that place, uh, from Karamoja? So I think, in my view, that uh, to agree with, the, with the everybody here, planning is a problem, but there is also intention. The intention, in my view, is to keep people poor so that they can continue going to state house to beg, and when they go there, they come back with yellow T-shirts, and they are happy. In fact, in Uganda, people don't put on these T-shirts because they believe in the party. They put on because that is what is available for them to put on. Uh, many of the people, in fact, when you ask, you ask him, you support NRM, he says, what shows? What about this shirt you are putting on? He says, uh, I thought this is just a shirt. <laughs> so poverty is a, 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 a facilitator 
of this dictatorship that is but Mr. moderator let's remove this impression it might be given to the viewers there uh, we are not saying that Uganda's economy is not growing. Actually, Uganda's economy has been growing. True. And two, uh, I think inflation in Uganda has been uh, contained to a minimum, except mm -hmm. now I can see it going up. What we are talking about and is... And Professor, do you know why inflation is down? Uh, because we food. depend on substance food. Substance farming. Subsistence yeah, farming. but also we are exporting gold. <laughs> <laughs> which others are not exporting. But the point I was making, we are commenting on the nature of the economy. Uh, and two, we are talking about the agencies, agencies of the economic development. Agencies are foreign, are foreigners and they are foreign agencies. That is what we are, uh, we are against. We are talking about foreignizing the economy we are not necessarily talking about, and, and the nature of the economy, the structure of the economy, but we are not necessarily saying that the economic growth has not taken place or inflation has not made, managed to a certain level. So you cannot have sustainable development when the agents of economic gro growth are foreigners and the agencies are foreigners. We need local, domestic, national agencies like in those Singapore we were talking about. Mm or Japan, there was a Ministry of Trade, Industry and Technology, or a certain ministry, or the National Development Authority. You know, in Uganda, we have got an authority without authority. <laughs> the National Development Authority says we do this, the government does the opposite. So, the nature of the economy, the agents of the economy, the agencies of the economy, not necessarily that there is no sum economic growth. Thank you, it's thank you, correct. and thank you, Dr. Robert, for that amazing submission. Now we shift the conversation to taxation in this country, and very recently we have a strike going on in the country by traders across the country. Dr. Hia talked about how he came from Eastern Uganda and shops were closed. When you go downtown Kampala, shops are closed. There is no trade happening, and the biggest reason from the traders is taxation and the taxation systems. I want to start with you, Dr. Sarah. Taxation and taxes in this country. A lot of conversation in the economy has been about how, we, how Ugandans are producing, how the government is getting the money, how the government is managing the money, and how we are going on. When you go to taxes, what is the key element in taxation that a Ugandan, a basic Ugandan that we talked about is not benefiting from the economy, should be interested in or worried about when we talk taxation? Well, there are four canons of taxation. And these include equity or fairness, certainty, convenience, and then the economy, how, uh, what's the structure of the economy, and what's the efficiency of the resources generated from uh, the tax administration in, in, in lessening the burden of a taxpayer? Or, where, or what do you use? What do you do with, with the money collected through taxes? If you look at these four canons of taxation, the question we need to ask is, are they fairly applied in Uganda? We have a range of indirect taxes. Whatever you pay tax as you consume. And that includes VAT, which is standard at 18%, and, and, and other several indirect taxes. Indirect taxes don't segregate between the rich and the poor. The rich cannot feel the weight of VAT, which is at the center of the Efris strike by the traders. But a poor person who wants to purchase this one or two items as a necessity feels a heavier burden of VAT than a rich person. And most likely, the rich person will buy from the wholesaler. And the poor person will buy from retail shops. What burden does this add in? VAT is charged 
as a cost for transportation and marketing. That, that's the value addition that URI talks about. It's not like the value addition we are discussing for agricultural products. So the value added in this time is a transportation and a marketing facility in a new area. When you import goods, you pay VAT. When a wholesaler now sells, so as you buy your goods online, like the generation Z, and, and uh, is it Z and what? Z and uh, Alpha. Mm -hmm. If you buy what your goods that? online, <laughs> if the goods arrive at the airport, you will pay tax for, for those goods if they are more than what you need for personal use. But when uh, people import goods and they put them in a wholesale unit, or even if these goods are locally manufactured through Bubu, by Uganda, Guild Uganda, the wholesaler who gets from a manufacturer will pay VAT of 18% to the, as they buy goods. They put them in their shop. So they will calculate the whole cost, but also charge new VAT new to VAT. the people who are coming yes. to buy. Now the retailer, retailers, as they buy from a wholesaler, they, have add, uh, they will add VAT. A consumer will finally go and buy, and also VAT is charged. So you find that the more the product moves from one point of sale to another, the price is likely to increase more and more, because at every point of sale there is VAT charge. So that's why how even the poor people pays more money for the same product that the rich people are going to buy. Because most likely the rich people are going to buy from the wholesalers. And the prices keep changing, even for small items like a bottle of water. If you buy from a depot or a wholesale point, water is cheaper. You find you pay 19000 for a box of mineral water. But if you buy from another center, you are paying 21000 Another person will pay 25000 Up to the extent that there are some places where water goes for 40000 Yet at one point of sale, it's 19000 So this is the burden that poorer people pay a higher, a higher burden. They bear a higher burden of indirect taxes than rich people. When you look at uh, other taxes, mostly from the, from the formal sector, pay which is at 34%, whatever you earn, 34% goes to government. But on top of that, you're going to incur a, a range of other indirect taxes as you buy basic clothes, water, whatever, fuel or public means transport, there will be a tax coming from the fuel tax and the rest. So you find that even the lower level of working class bear a higher burden. Because as you take 34% of their money, this is more money. Somebody earning 1 million will have 3,000, no, 340,000, 340,000 going to the taxman. So their take home has reduced. And this also reduces the purchasing power parity of citizens. When you go to the businesses generally, the, there is a proposal to, uh, to add tax on goods auctioned, uh, for, for public auction, to add tax on money lending agents. Yet there are usual money, money agents, the, the, the see, banking agents. Yes. Yet there are usual banking charges, standard banking charges that apply. So when you add this tax, if you bank money through a money a bank agent, mobile banking agent, when you go to the ATM to withdraw, you will pay the ATM cost. But also now if money is added on this, yet the deposits are free of tax in the bank. So when you go now to deal with a, a mobile money agent, you are going to find you are incurring a tax that you wouldn't incur in, in a normal banking institution. So what would then be the rationale of, of people going? To, to a banking agent. So most of these uh, proposed taxes are in that manner. And we are increasing the tax burden of people in formal employment. Informal sector might be difficult to charge tax, to levy tax on, the convenience of correction, which is another canon of taxation. But to what extent are we going to burden a smaller section of population with heavy taxes? 
with other sectors, especially the livestock sector. I don't know why it's prohibited debate in this country to levy taxes at the point of, of sale for livestock animals, especially cows. Mm -hmm. A cow fetches a minimum of 2.5 million in the market. That's the minimum. And those are small cows. Some people sell cows at 10 million. Just one cow. You cannot tax this cow that has been sold at a range of 2.5 million to 10 million, but you want to tax the 1 million and increase taxes for an, uh, 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 an employer in the former sector who earns 1 million, you want to take away 34% of that money, but you need also to burden this employer with a chain of indirect taxes on their head. Where is the fairness in tax? Can everybody pay their sh fair share of the tax? Because that's the general principle in taxation. As I conclude, just allow me a few minutes. What's the use of this money? The efficiency. Government has public goods that they must deliver back to a taxpayer. These include security, public roads, education, health, justice law and sector, among others. These are the key public goods. How efficient is the delivery of these key public goods to a taxpayer? Thank you, Doctor, for that comprehensive overview of the taxation. Uh, Dr. Robert, one of the things Dr. Birete talks about is a small tax base, and this has been a conversation for a very long time. Why and how does your a fail to widen its tax base in this country? Yeah, of course I sympathize with you, RA. It is uh, a new system, and the majority of the people there are really gambling. You remember when the URA was starting, they were not even using pure economists. Uh, the first commissioner of URA was a psychologist. And uh, therefore, I think she who, was just... Who was that? Kajina. Kajina. Okay. But yeah. it was not the first. She, there was a Mzungu when they Oh, denied, I mean the one I know. The, when they yeah. denied the red Kanyomo's uh, Yeah, job. the one I know in Uganda and was... Was the Nigerian, uh, Ghanaian, actually. The Ghanaian, the Ghanaian, okay, handed over to Kajina. Let me speak mm. about Kajina. You know? mm, there was a time there was Wakakoko. He's an economist. Wakakoko? I think he's an accountant. Hey. So a uh, majority of the people there have really been uh, struggling to build the system. And over time, this building of the system through gambling has created a lot of problems. So as Sarah said, for you to have a good tax system, you must have a good tax base. And I've been arguing that a good tax base is, is based on the productivity of the country, the, pro the productivity level. Uh, when you look at, uh, at Uganda generally, it's a, it's a production for consumption economy. Many of the people do produce to consume. So, in simple terms, it is a peasant economy. Uh, because we don't have uh, uh, where we are producing in large scale for the market. More so, the, the common market that uh, the president talks about, which is the foreign market, where you get foreign, ex foreign exchange. Because that's where you would get, that's why she gave <coughs> statistics and said trade is earning us very little money. Uh, we are, we, in fact, we are we are in, in the balance of trade. of trade. We are in negatives. We are not getting anything. We need businesses. more money. And I've been telling my students that, you see, this economy of yours has a very big problem. You are producing watermelon and purple and banana. That's what you're exporting to Sudan and other places. How many purples or watermelons or bunches of banana do you need to buy one iPhone? It is, I don't know, I've, I've lost his iPhone, what? There is now the most 15, 15 uh, which is, uh, I don't want to talk about it because the money is obscene. How many would you need, how many lorries would you need of purple to buy one iPhone? I see, we just want to simplify things like that. That's why you saw negative five and $39 million. million dollars. Trade deficit. Uh, mm. So there is that trade deficit. Mm. So when you have a trade deficit, it means that now you have to get these vulnerable people 
to be the ones to run the economy through taxation, where they are not also able to pay. Because a good country should have fast motivated production. Yesterday I was discussing this with an economist friend of mine and was telling me that this tax, uh, tax regime is only retarding production. I was telling you the other day that a number of companies, and URA was the one reporting this, the good news is mm. that uh, this is not from propagandists, the politicians, no, it is URA. What had graded the companies uh, said a company which, is, which was producing from this billion to this billion, there were 150. Now there are only seven. Mm. And this one where this number, and there are only three, yeah. and so on and so forth. And it showed that the tax, one of the problems is the tax, the tax regime. Because of the small tax base, you find one person being targeted to pay almost everything. Uh, companies like Madhavani right now are really struggling. The other day I was talking to, to the general manager of Madhavani on other business. Then he was explaining to me how they are facing a very big problem. The economy is struggling. Or, or, or no taxation. Because when they, now, they have now gone there, sugarcane, <laughs> sugarcane, when the, 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 the farmer brings sugarcane to the factory, he has to pay tax. So that tax is transferred to him, where the, the farmers are saying, but they are taxing us a lot of money, so you have to add it on the price. Now, when you, you add it on the price, it means, the, it means that the cost of production becomes high. And when the cost of production becomes high, your sugar must be a little bit higher. But there are people producing sugar under subsidies. They are producing sugar now in Uganda. Some factories have been given subsidies. I will not mention their name for their security. Under subsidies. So you will find they are selling sugar uh, at a lower rate. But two, they are not even producing for this market. Mm. Many of the factories don't produce, for example, there are so many market uh, sugar companies in, in that Busoga region. But have you asked yourself why you don't see their brand of sugar in the market? Is it of this quality? No, they're exporting it directly to countries which are known to themselves. Because there is one in Bugiri which belongs to people, big people in the government. There is another one, a G GM here, GM uh, after Nyenga. It belongs to a big person in, 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 in government. But why don't you see their sugar in the market? So for them, they are producing under, under subsidies. So at the end of the day, why what Sarah is explaining? A small tax base is because people are not able to pay the tax. Many of the people are in, in a subsistence economy. And unfortunately, you are your farmers in of Kato in, in, in Ankore and Teso are still categorized under those subsistence farmers. Yes. So who cannot pay tax? But uh, for me, if I take my small thing in the market, in the market right now, there is, a, you, I have to pay tax, local government tax in some of these markets. All of them have these local government taxes in the market. The market uh, dues. Dues and yeah, what okay. have you. So at the end of the day, the only quickest, and that's why I, I like this URI people, they have really exposed themselves in these two weeks. They have exposed themselves on TV and on radios. They have really exposed their weakness. They are targeting the, the, the weak target. The weak target is a trader. Because the trader, they are lazy, in my view. They are lazy people. So a trader is, becomes a, a, a good target so that they put a machine, that machine of yours have failed to... Point of sale to, to, machine. The point of sale machine, so that you collect tax. As Sarah was explaining, that now a trader is supposed to collect tax for URA. Then you remit it. And uh, they were explaining to traders, and I was asking why. Because they, Sarah, they were explaining that when uh, the wholesaler pays VAT, mm. and then they charge me VAT, yes. that I should claim for it. But now, many of our traders, 
those processes of claiming taxes, how, how many how can many afford? How many times have you claimed? And if they claim, when who will pay you? Uh, one time, <laughs> one time <laughs> I, I stayed in a certain country. And these people go to benchmark in these countries. When you go to that country, I'll not mention its name also, you, you, when you buy things, mm. so long as you are not going to stay there, your VAT is refunded yeah. at the point of exit. Now, what do they do? When they are refunding, so long as you give the things, and they do it in a few minutes, yes. they give you a card, a card, an ATM card, so that when you come to Uganda, you use this ATM card in your bank of your choice, and you get your money. Yeah. If they would put such a thing, nobody would be arguing. So the second thing that I'm talking about is the poor tax collection method. The method is rudimentary. It's still the Zakayo way. In Kenya now, people are calling their president Zakayo because of taxi. It's not only a Ugandan problem, even in Kenya. So, so, so the poor collection, which is even brutal. And three, the tax transfer. When you transfer this tax, because they are they're asking traders that for you, what is your problem? This tax will be paid by the final consumer. The trader is looking at the sales. The sales are reducing drastically, and yet he has more demands to meet. So when the tax is reduced, the ability to buy the good becomes very difficult because they, they transfer it to this local person. And as Sarah said, I want to confirm, the person who faces the wrath of a tax is the common man, yeah. the poor person, the poor person who is buying cooking oil, who is buying sugar, who is buying these simple, simple things at 500, at 1,000. They are the ones, that's why people are poor, because every little money that they earn, they give it back to government. And uh, I'll, I hope you will give me a chance later to talk about the use of tax. That is the worst in Uganda data. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor, one of the conversations that has come out in the strike and you are explaining things is the use of IFRIS, the advantage, how it is implemented and so on. But traders are saying this is not a good system for themselves. Why is IFRIS a challenge? Uh, thank you, but I will come to IFRIS a little bit later, but let me first also talk in generalities about the tax regime in Uganda. We need to characterize this tax regime uh, in general so that if there has to be proposals for reform, we looked at it from a wider context. One is that the, the, the taxes in Uganda are retrogressive. They are not progressive. Not progressive. Retrogressive in the sense that we tax uh, consumption rather than taxing income. And when you tax consumption, the tax actually falls on the poor, True. not the rich. True. So we need to shift from that characterization of retrogressive to progressive. Two, many people, I think, do not get this tax issue regime clearly. I have heard people saying that Ugandans are heavily taxed, the country is heavily taxed, blah, 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 blah. Yes and no. No, in the sense that the ratio of tax to GDP in Uganda is the lowest in the region. Actually, Sub-Saharan Africa is about 18%, the tax to, ratio, to, to GDP ratio. Mm. And the East African community recommended 25% tax to GDP ratio. And the National Planning Authority recommends something like 16 and above. So Uganda's tax to GDP ratio is extremely low. So you can see a mismatch and an irony that where people are complaining, are crying about heavy taxation, again the country gets less from tax. And therefore when we are discussing taxation, we need to get this anomaly. We need to get the grips of this anomaly. I hope the listeners are getting that one. And three, uh, people have talked about it. We have got a very narrow tax base. Basically because our economy is also informal. It's an informal economy. But again, 
I think what uh, colleagues have pointed out is the tax policy. We may, uh, doctor here tended to almost blame only revenue authority, but I think we, not, we need not blame only revenue authority. Revenue authority is at the level of Implementation. tax management, tax administration, not tax policy. Tax policy is government and parliament. And therefore, the, the, the policy is leaving out certain people from the bracket, which members were talking about. If you are producing 100 kilos of rice, why wouldn't you pay a tax? And there are people who are producing those in the north and the east. If you are producing a, a, a two lorries, you are selling two lorries of matoke every month, why wouldn't you pay the, the, the tax? And much more so if you are trading in those commodities, those who are trading those commodities also don't pay tax. tax. There is also tax exemption, which is a government thing. That's not URA. There are very many foreign companies that receive tax exemption on a criteria that is not clear. Because tax exemption globally are used to stimulate the economy. True. But here you have tax exemption to a company which, does not, which makes an agreement but does not follow it, does not provide employment, does not transfer technology, does not do certain things to the country. And there is tax exemption. That is at the policy level. There is also tax referral where there is inequality. There are some individuals in Uganda who, when they import goods into the country, their tax payment is referred. You can pay it after you have sold the goods. But there is inequality where certain individuals are favored and given tax referral when others are not given tax referral. There is tax evasion. There is a category of people who evade tax and those who are prevented from evading tax. Therefore, coming to IFRIS, when you, when you talk about IFRIS, one of the problems of IFRIS and the complaint, actually, and the protest, is not the cause. IFRIS is not the cause. IFRIS is the occasion for tax protest. There are very many other things that they are protesting against other than IFRIS. I hope the listeners get it. That you tax people unequally, that you have a narrow tax base, that you exempt some people, that you give some people referrals when others are not given. So there, there, there is a general complaint coming to IFRIS now. Personally, I have no problem with IFRIS. I think IFRIS is a new wine in old, in old bottles. IFRIS is a tool, is a program, is a computer program, which is supposed to formalize tax payment, essentially by traders, rather than remaining informal. But you see, there is a mismatch. You have an informal economy, and then you introduce a tool that is, that is formalizing the economy. You go to Chikubo, and you find somebody coming from Sudan or Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo is buying many cartons. When you are a trader there, and you don't have enough cartons, you rush to your neighbor, to your friend, to your colleague, and you bring some cartons to add on to these ones. But now those ones will not be captured in the receipt systems and invoice. Mm. Because this IFRIS is about invoice and receipting. Mm. How do you do that one? I'm just borrowing, I'm hurrying. The man wants to go to Juba. <laughs> and then you catch me. So, uh, and people are borrowing. Oh, you ask from if Kafuna. the money doesn't have, he goes to the next shop and... People are buying from Kafuna. They mm. are buying from, uh, they are buying borrowing. And they are doing all these sorts of things in an informal way. And yet you are formalizing. So there is a mismatch there. But otherwise, this is a new wine in old bottles. I think it is trying to formalize tax management. Because I am told that most of those people have been charging us VAT, they end up not remitting it to URA. They have been cheating with the consumers. And IFRIS is correcting that one. And they are running away from it. And IFRIS is not only in Uganda. It are, actually, we are late. If this is in, in Rwanda, if this is in Tanzania, actually it was in Tanzania when Magufuri was still there. You know, he died very many, some years back. He actually, actually, they also went on, on, on strike and he sort of did. If this is in Kenya. So if this is not totally out of place, only that the wider tax regime is not commensurate with 
IFRIS as a tool of tax management and tax correction. So, finally, I want to talk about what the doctor here talked about, linking tax to public service. Public services or delivery, delivery of public services. You see, but that's why I'm saying that IFRIS protest strike is not the cause of the strike. It is the occasion for the strike. Because people are looking at what they pay, you know, they would, they would be compliant. They, they, would, they, 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 they would be enthusiastic maybe about paying. But how do you pay tax? And somebody in the parliament goes for a vacation. How? How do I look at somebody going for a vacation and pay uh, uh, and, oh, and, getting, and gets five million shilling, uh, dollars, dollars per day? Five thousand. Five thousand, sorry. Five thousand dollars oh, per day. Oh. And you come to tell me to pay tax, tax under IFRIS, which is expensive to run, by the way, because it's a complicated uh, 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 IT system. Some traders will not manage it. They will have to hire you, young people. On Saturday, you will go there and you receipt those things and give invoices and uh, in order to comply with URA. And they pay you 200000 That's the cost to their profit. How do I forego that profit for somebody to go for a vacation? I think IFRIS is actually uh, uh, raising consciousness among Ugandans to demand fair taxation, to, give, to demand a fair tax regime, and also to demand services and to stop state extravagance. There are, are poor roads here, and you're telling me that you are going for a vacation? There are poor roads here, and you're telling me you are, going, you are buying expensive vehicles of more than 600 million? There are, there, there are no services I have seen in the schools uh, where people are studying uh, under trees. I saw last week somebody in West, some school in West Nile, they are studying under grass such small houses and you go to Nigeria you, you go to Nigeria here uh, near our place here this road going to Nigeria and you see the potholes in that area and then you are telling somebody to pay taxes heavy taxes so the protest may not be against if it's per se the protest is now a realization a consciousness realization that we are being short changed that people are going for vacations after this uh, exposure, uh, is it exhibition of parliament, now I have been told that on their budget they have increased it by 125 billion in this financial year. Yeah. And yet some budgets have been deducted. The budget for paying school fees, uh, uh, tuition fees for university has actually been removed. They are only continuing with those who are there. The coming ones are not accessing. So why should Ugandans pay all those taxes we are milked for some state officials to enjoy luxury of vacations? So the IFRI thing, yes, to me, it is, uh, it is timely. It is new wine. Of course, uh, when a new wine is mixed in old bottles, there is likely to be tension. Uh, there is tension. But I think it can be improved one way or the other. But I think people are looking at it as, first of all, expensive. It is going to eat into their money. Some of them are not genuine. It's not legitimate. So if this protest is both legitimate and illegitimate. But it can be solved temporarily. But what will not be solved is a nickel tax regime where people are beginning to be conscious, where our resources are wasted, in vocations, in vacations, in all sorts of manner of wastage, and then you are making this person on the ground. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Honorable Chen, one of the things Professor points out is these are from the policy level, from you, the politicians. And, uh, there is policy level, and then there is administration level. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things he talks about is how extravagant you, the politicians, are in terms of... Political class spending the taxpayers' money. It seems politicians <laughs> continue to be a very big challenge to this country, to the taxpayer. Oh, boy is looking yes. at you in disbelief. <laughs> that, that is what I say. That's what I've been saying all along. 
and particularly you plus many of you young people used to think that whenever I came onto this program for the last several years, you know, I was coming here for an afternoon uh, nap. No, I, I come here for serious business to try and wake you up, to try and wake the citizens up. And I'm delighted to be having this conversation. In fact, I've told another television network the other, the other day that maybe the time for a revolution, a practical, actual revolution, is nay, that perhaps we need to go to the streets, except they should not use the, the kind of Mutaimbo and Museveni and Kagame used in Luero to break the necks of our people. We have had many revolutions to come and they have come to nothing. We are tired of revolutions. Um, that, 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 is, that, is your, that is your opinion, because these are actually political concepts. These are revolutionary, uh, uh, these are actually political concepts. So people have options, and in any case, that's the thing. The beauty of democracy, which unfortunately this country has been denied. The people who eat money are not on the street, they are with suits. Yeah, they are in the suits. Yeah. I've stopped there. I've stopped there. Yeah, you had a lot of it today. But look, I so so I've been a little, a little bit disoriented with this. So the point is this. <laughs> Sorry. What we're discussing is really politics. So the policy thing is politics, the taxation thing is politics. And that's what I told at the beginning, and this is basically uh, 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 what is absent. The absence in the, the entirety of the, 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 the system in the country is uh, po political leadership. And that's why um, I, I hope, once again I repeat, that there is a revolution of some sort, whatever definition that revolution is, that Ugandans do wake up, that they're being taken for a ride by NRM Museveni over the last 40 years. And that for those of us in UPC, we say, no. and you know, I take this absolutely seriously. One of the missing links is that Museveni managed, um, thankfully with the backing of his Western dubious friends for pushing their new liberal agenda, to arrest Ugandans and hold them for 20 years, to kill politics. So Dr. Jam, when Museveni came to power and killed political competition, he poke killed this kind of conversation, which you are now, fair enough, and the uh, is actually right, that we are having. You know, part of what he's saying is that um, um, by the apparently political science is now a dead subject and civics is now a dead subject in uh, education in Uganda under Mr. and Mrs. Museveni's uh, educational system, isn't it? So part of the conversation we should be having, a natural anomaly, is that um, you know, uh, the young listeners would be able to appreciate what revolutions are, appreciate what democracy is, appreciate what socialism is, appreciate what you know, fair and progressive taxation are. These are matter of routines that today I see some political people in politics, so-called political leaders, being challenged on televisions, and then they go mouth again because they have no clue because of these are conversations that are not taking place. Number two, in normal policy, unfortunately, with a 20-year deficit by this NRB and disbanding political parties, but thanks to UPC, now you have an opportunity, you young guys. We're able to begin to have a debate, put NUP on the spot. What basically, uh, what in terms of ideological leanings, what do you represent? Are, are, are you a progressive leftist political party? Are you a socialist political party? Or are you not? These kind of stuff that we are talking about would then be able to help us critique um, that in, in, in NRA, perhaps FDC, in this case, thankfully UPC, that we're basically on the basis of what you represent in terms of we move to the left. What was the big agenda? What was the big idea you have for this country? And what exactly are your representations? That then would go on to manifest on um, your man man manifesto as well, programs that you go and sell to the citizen. So UPC's programs are sold, FDC's programs are sold, NRA basic programs, if any, are sold to the people. And in the course of this, academicians, you know, and uh, critical thinkers and lawyers and activists like self, they critique our programs. And in those programs, you not only have, have a general, broad uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, policies and programs, but including on taxation and in fact, tax, inflation, those are the no, taxation, inflation, uh, 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 unemployment, you know, um, are usually the yeah. key yeah. underpinning yeah. items of discussions during political elections. Then you go ahead and say yes, when you look at the, 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 the annual, annual, uh, annual budget, bu budget, in terms of budget applications, how much do you, uh, are you allocating to education? How much are you allocating to health? I'm actually shocked about the conversation being talked about educational budget being, being shrunk when um, the NR Assembly, which is one of the largest parliaments in the world and one of the most incompetent parliaments in the world, is being doubled. Nobody is asking these questions. These are conversations that must be held. 
you're absolutely right that uh, the people on the spot are political leaders, but we've been actually on the buy. But look, um, on this question of taxation, um, progressive tax, you know, or not, you know, it's a combination of both. There are times where you will tax incomes, you know, there are times when you have tax incomes, and quite rightly, but there are times when you also use tax incentives, you know, to, 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 to enable, to cushion the citizenry. And uh, during the COVID times, by then, I wasn't yet on this platform in Kampala. I was, I had a call, my column in the Senate Monitor. I used this severally to persuade Enery to try and push for relief, you know, <laughs> tax relief onto the masses that they're now targeting in Chikubu. And I don't think people understood what I was saying. You know, the fact that uh, Ugandans now can say no, whether it's IFRIS or not, is actually a new thing for us in the country. Meaning people beginning to ask, how much are we paying, if at all, in, in terms of particular direct taxes? I've argued that a future UPC government in which I'm involved, you know, would possibly um, have a tax threshold, would possibly radically up to maybe 500,000. But of course, yeah, the issue would be about what is the tax base and how many people are, 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 are meet the taxation criteria. Why? Because you do the relief and then you avoid some of the safe thing. And then you go on to the indirect taxes. On the indirect taxes, it is true that you can go regressive, you know, uh, 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 on certain items where you know that everyone else is going to buy an average loaf of bread. But there are areas where you'll actually focus and simply say that, well, um, beer is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a luxury, you know, um, and then you, you tax high on beer, things like... Uh, uh, secret. That's what all established democratic governments do. And then those are the things that uh, infringe on the environment. And then you do tax relief and tax exemptions to things to do with the craft products, medical products, and things like that. But when you're able to do that, whatever you do, unless and until you're able to invest sufficiently in education, sufficiently in health. And in education, it shocks me. Even as I was leaving my house to come into this program, I was talking to a young cleaner who's left senior three. And the young cleaner tells of how her brother, also her, hus her husband, also dropped off senior four. And all of them are talking about fees and education. And they don't know that, um, you know, in, under UPC program, they would not be out of school. Why? Because in her husband's case, who passed senior four, you know, if he does not go to A level, which was then free anyway, he would go to branch off to either, you know, uh, teaching, uh, any tertiary education was free. Now, these things were free under UPC administration, just... 40, 40 years ago. You know, why can't it be free now? That's one of those who are pushing this book. This book, you know, what, talking about what Museveni did, is one of those things that we need to urgently investigate and give hope to Dr. Jambo to say that, look, some of the things that happened was not miraculous. It was done by Ugandans and it was done predominantly led by UPC. It is actually as possible for us to turn around these things and do better for this country. My worry, though, as we talk about politics, we need to retire, you know, these uh, NRA guys, these NRA bodies, we need to retire them. Younger Ugandans need to emerge, even if they're within NRM, NRA, you know, a younger group of, group of thinkers should come into lead politics. But generally, NRA needs to retire, have a rest, so that a new political dispensation led by new critical programs that are able to address many of these other things takes hope and gives hope to the people of Uganda. Thank you, Honorable. Dr. Yeah, can I give a figure just quickly? Please. Uh, to show that our, our tax base is narrow. Uh, Eight million Ugandans are eligible to pay the direct tax now. We are talking about direct tax. They are eligible. Eight million. Only 3.7 are, are, are registered to pay. Th are registered with team. Only 3.7 out of eight. And out of the 3.7 who are registered, only 1.7 million end up paying the direct tax, indirect tax of course all of us pay. So you can see the challenge here. Of from eight million, only three point seven are registered, only one point seven end up paying. We need to improve and if I think can go a long way to improve on this tax correction. But the, the URA must um, also respect uh, the, the, the taxpayers they, they must be accessible, they must be respected, they must respect, they must, it must be accessible, and things like that. And so that people, and simplified, so that these people can understand this app. Thank you. That was Prof. information. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sarah.
Mm. One of the conversations that, uh, yes, briefly, as I'll see, come on. He, he's coming. One of the conversations that have come out of the traders, they say they are on strike, but political leaders are silent, civil society is silent, other unions of workers are silent, they are not supporting them. Why are all these people silent? No, I don't think that's true, that that's mm. false. The uh, political leaders, all of them on Monday, addressed press conferences about who efforts and the traders strike. Second, I was on TV myself. I'm a member of the civil society sector. I'm talking, discussing efforts and the plight of traders. So that's not true. And I know many people have been in all spaces speaking about the plight of traders, the need for fair taxation, the need for everyone to pay a fair share of taxation, and the need, because as much as Professor says, EFRIS is a good system. For the benefit of viewers, EFRIS is an electronic fiscal receipting and information system. It's a computerization of revenue generation. Going digital is okay. But for any change, you need to work on mindset change of the users. So there is always hesitancy to adaptability of new things. So part of the challenges with EFRIS is hesitancy to adapt to digital means. Second, the bulk of traders in Chikubo are illiterate or semi-literate. Mm -hmm. You are telling them to use smartphones, you are telling them to, and then they don't have too much labor resource. So when you say, buy a point of sale machine, it, it is ab about $100. You are taking away somebody's capital. You are not even distributing. Mm -hmm. Because part of the induction program, onboarding processes, maybe you and I can procure these points and say, we have brought these gadgets. Is the, you know, the transition of traders into this process? Simplify. The second issue is the brutality. If you go now downtown and you are met with the goods, the, the, the way the, those reven soldiers that are brought into revenue, they are manhandling traders, they are manhandling customers, they are, some of us buy and deliver receipts in mm. the bins at the, at the mm. entrance. So you meet me with goods and you want to manhandle me where I've got the goods and where the receipts. Have they shared this information with the public? I rarely carry receipts because at times it's depressing. See how much money you've spent <laughs> yeah. in, in a supermarket and what goods you've carried. The, fact, the cost of living is so high. I find receipts myself so depressing, I don't want to look at them. So I throw them in the bins as I, as I exit shops. Now you meet me with goods and that's a crime. The, the, the penalties they are putting on traders, six million every one receipt. Traders are in millions and millions of, of penalties. Are we building a country? Are we building an economy? Oh, we are here to destroy. And the most painful thing with paying tax in this country, the wasteful mentality of our leadership. A cabinet of whoever, hundreds, a parliament of so many millions with no value addition. Our roads are degraded and degenerated. We jump from one hole to another. Every day our vehicles are in garages. So what is the use of tax? Thank you. And Dr. Robert, we know the traders have been around, they have met Minister of Finance, they have met Parliament, and we know they are meeting the President very soon. But uh, Tomorrow, actually. Yes. How do we sustainably end the strike and harmonize the works of traders in the city and across? I know the strike is going to end because many traders right now are even fatigued. Because in Uganda here, we have an economy of hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. Just a mere not selling for two, three days is already biting them. So they will just be forced back. But it doesn't move the problem that uh, forced them there. And I don't see anybody with the capacity to resolve that problem. When you, look, uh, when you look at Why our not? planning with our policy levels, uh, uh, he was talking about the parliament. I wish he, he, he was referring to a normal parliament. Our parliament is an abnormal parliament, it's a caucasity parliament, where a majority of the members of, the, of, of parliament who are there do not know even why they go to parliament. In fact, majority of them go there, sit, 
and uh, as they are discussing things in the plenary, they're in the canteen taking tea and discussing how to, they can pay their debts and the other problems. How do you get these tents in the village because they have become uh, they have become funeral service providers in the village. Uh, it is going to be worse. I told you last time I was here that they're introducing new five bills. And those five bills, I looked at them carefully. One of them is on VAT. So as they complain to pay 18%, the bill is proposing VAT to 20. be increased to 20%. So there is an increment of VAT. Then there is also, VAT is going to be paid on a number of things. Yes. They are introducing VAT on uh, borrowed money. When you are borrowing money, <laughs> you should do, because you, for them you are getting an income. Oh. You should do pay VAT on it. I don't know how. They are, they are, they are coming up with exercise, excise duty on a number of things. Many people now are going to pay excise duty. Excise duty was only for traders, which they claim. But now they are giving people who don't even have capacity to pay, I mean, to claim excise duty. They are introducing a, 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 a income tax on people who are selling land. So whether you are selling land to Gandhi be treated in India, or you are selling land to pay school fees, or you are selling land to do what? Because for me, I would imagine that if somebody is trading in land like Jomai, or these other traders in land, those ones, they would pay tax. Mm. But now somebody is selling land because he or she is distressed. Because the majority of the people who sell land in Uganda are not commercial land traders. Mm. They are selling land because they are distressed. They mm. have a distress. Mm. So those are going to pay a tax right now. Uh, they, they, and so many. In fact, they have increased. Let, let me just add one that yes. is really ridiculous. So we were talking of Madvan a, a few minutes ago. So if Madvan serves sugar for tea for his workers, the workers are going to be charged VAT. Because the government does not want to lose this sugar from Madvan that is consumed as tea in the office. Yes. Or if you give workers mm -hmm. free you sugar, give, yes. you must yes. pay. Yes. 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 And if you buy sodas for your staff, then the staff you will pay. be VAT. So these are very ridiculous things. But what is going to surprise you? These things are going to be approved once in the parliament. Mm. You yeah. will just be, see an omnibus approval. Without knowing. So, number one, do you, uh, that or tax-related things can only be resolved by a good administration. Good. Where we have a good Minister of Finance, because URA works for Minister of Finance. Where you have a good planning unit, there is a planning unit in this country, which I think is ceremonial. NPA. Yes, National Planning Authority. It is almost ceremonial. But I don't, the Minister of Trade that is in confusion, where the permanent secretary is fighting everybody. And they have taken the general who <laughs> all his life has been following commanding army. Now, still, sometimes you look at this country. So we are going to get worse things and the, the tax issues are not going to. And I don't know. That's why Ojeno says that if we would reach a time, and the, that's why some of us spend some time here so that we can talk to people and they learn, that your voice matters. These issues of politicians is not just choosing this one and choosing the other one and choosing this one. They should tell you what they are going to offer. MP, what ability of debate do you have? Or you are just going to come and say so and so, oye, and we send you to parliament. Or you put on a red beret or a, a yellow shirt and we send you to parliament. Because these guys are going to discuss issues that affect your life. When people are giving they manifesto, you for the rest of your life. when people are giving a manifesto, don't just be excited that a president has provided the parish development model. Then you say, yeah, 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 but yeah, they will not get rich. We need to look at these things and we ask questions. If it means not voting for some time, let's not vote. Mm -hmm. But please, people need to get out. Everything in life is politics. So if you think that for me, those political things do not concern me. You will meet with them 
in the market when you are paying VAT, you will meet with them in, in Chirudu when you are paying for medicine, you will meet with them on the road. The, the, she was calling them potholes. Mm. No longer in Uganda, we don't have now potholes. Mm. We have pit holes. Pit. Huge things which you have to be very careful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. And uh, briefly, Professor, in a minute, our time is very no, much The minute I wanted to, 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 to take would be on uh, the debate now. Mm. I think if we... The positive thing about IFRIS is that it has brought the issue of tax on the surface. And therefore, let's discuss the tax. Because there is no government that cannot tax. And there is no country that can survive without taxation. And there are no services without taxation. But we have not debated these issues. IFRIS has helped us to begin the conversation, the national conversation, about taxation. So, beyond IFRIS, as a, a, a tool which may have infringed on the, the comfort of the traders, we need to debate how to expand the tax base. One, we also need to debate the question of tax evasion. Tax evasion is not by some smart guys per se. No. You go to Casita, they will tell you that a certain commodity, imported commodity, if you go into that one, you are not going to survive. Why? Because in that sector, somebody well connected the is there and imports <laughs> without paying taxes and he will understand you. Why doesn't government, if it is serious, go and consider people, ask them, whom do you think is evading the taxes? How can we... The government knows. Professor, there are some people, and this is information from the business community, there are some people who import huge volumes of goods, they reach URA, and their goods are created by virtue of appearance or cheats and without paying any tax. Unless we stop that gamba knob <laughs> in the tax regime, the taxes will continue to be low because it is an anomaly. It is a, a paradox that we are crying because of, of our being taxed. But at the same time, our tax to GDP ratio is the lowest even in the whole of East Africa. Why? It means, that's why you see somebody constructing a house of nine stories, ten stories in Nakasero. But if you ask that person how much he has remitted to URA, it is almost next to nothing. Unless we look at this issue he of even tax. ask you what is URA. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, this issue of tax evasion <laughs> uh, 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 and tax exemption, uh, we are going to go wrong. It is not necessary, by the way, let me repeat it. It is not necessary that the problem is basically with tax administration by URA. No. They have got pressures from the political class who tell them to exempt certain people, who tell them to leave certain people because they vote correctly. And they also want money to abuse for their vacations. Yes, for the vacations. So we have to address the question of tax base expansion and avoid tax evasion Everybody. by those who are politically connected. Everybody should pay their fair share yeah. Yeah, true. of that tax. And there is nobody who is saying we shouldn't pay tax, but then the tax must be equal. Otherwise, an equal taxation is a big, 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 big problem that might lead to a crisis in this country. Thank you so much. Everybody must pay their fair share, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so, so much for your views and for sparing time to be with us today. Our viewers, we appreciate your time and being with us all the time. It is the Citizens Chat Show on Civic Space TV. Remember, this is made possible by the Center for Constitutional Governance. Special thanks to the people behind the machines, and we say good evening, and may you have freedom always.